who am I fighting? And they go, Frank Lopman. I say, the animal? I mean, that was his nickname. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming by. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 362. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Shihan Bosruten. If you're new to the show, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm your host for this show, and I love martial arts, so I turned it into my job. And I appreciate you coming by twice a week to check out these episodes, to listen to everything that we've got going on, listen to the wonderful stories from the guests, and of course, to check out the things that we offer. You can visit whistlekick.com for our products and whistlekickmartialartsradio.com will get you show notes for this episode and all of the other episodes, including photos, videos, links, transcripts, a ton of stuff to give you more context, more enjoyment, more benefit from each of these episodes that we do. This is not an MMA show. We make no confusion about that. But there are times when a mixed martial arts becomes part of the conversation And that's okay. In fact, that is a good thing. And then we also get people who have a foot in more than one world. And that's today's guest. Shihan Bosruten is best known for his time as a competitor, as a mixed martial arts competitor. And he also holds the distinction of being one of the few people in the world who is known simply by his first name in preparing for this show, and even after. I commented to a few friends, a few people that I knew, to say, hey, I just talked to Boz. And I did it as much as a test as anything else. And guess what? Every single one of them knew who I was talking about. Now, of course, here he's Shihan Rutan, because he does have deep, substantial, significant, And as we're going to hear, important traditional martial arts roots. And that was why we brought him on the show. Because we wanted to talk about traditional martial arts and mixed martial arts. And I really couldn't think of a single better person that had the credibility, the lineage, and the accomplishments to speak on the subjects as they relate to one another. So here we are. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Let me step out of the way and welcome today's guest. Shihan Rudin, welcome to Whistle King Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. It is a pleasure to have you. Now, of course, we're going to have some folks out here who, who know you by name, who know different things about you. And my hope today is that we're going to go in some different directions, give people some insight into who you are, into your traditional martial arts background, and all of the things that gave you the foundation to move into all of the things that you did later on. All right. Yeah. So let's start with a pretty boring question that always leads to some great stuff. How did you first find martial arts? Oh, yeah. She, there's a long answer with me. <clears throat> so what happened was I was very sick as a kid. I had a, a really bad skin disease, eczema, covered my hands and my arms and in my neck and parts of my face all over my body, but my arms and my hands. And neck were the worst on my ears. I had it everywhere. It was really uh, disgusting. So it's pretty, uh, kids don't understand that. So I got bullied a lot. I also had severe asthma. So I, 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 t- I think, I believe I took uh, 45 pills a day. And of course, inhalers were constantly there. And I had every six weeks or so, I had on top of having my regular asthma, I had an asthma attack, which would mean like a week in bed, not able to eat at times because I simply couldn't breathe, you know? So uh, needless to say, I was very skinny. And because of the skin disease, you know, I was bullied a lot, and um, and that made me always play. I, I always, I was always in the forest. Uh, at the back of my house, in front of our home, actually, we had a forest, a small forest, and uh, I could climb in trees there, and I could go literally from treetop to treetop, and I could pretty much go through the forest. I there were like three or four spots where I had to climb down because there it was too far away another tree, but for the rest, it came very in handy if people would, kids would bully me because they would come after me, and I simply climbed in a tree. And then I would wait till they started climbing in a tree. And when they almost reached the top, I started swinging from left to right, moving the tree, and then went to the other tree. And then, of course, uh, that went wrong one time for one of the kids who was following me. And from that moment on, I was completely in the clear. Nobody had the, the cojones, so to say, to climb after me in the tree. So that was my <laughs> safe spot. It was the only thing I did. And then when I was 
what is it, 12 years old, we saw the movie Enter the Dragon from Bruce Lee uh, in France. We sneaked in because it was uh, a movie for 17 years and older and I was 12 years old. And that's when my eyes opened because I realized, wait a minute, if I, if I become a little bit like that guy Bruce over there, then I can deal with my bullies. So I came home, asked uh, my mom and dad if I could do martial arts. They, they stopped me for like two years. They didn't want it. They thought it was violence and aggression. But then finally, after two years, they finally allowed it. Taekwondo, that was my first sport. And um, I was very fortunate to, hit, uh, to be taken under the wing by this tough guy who was dating the, my neighbor girl. He was the tough guy in town, and he was training there with the adults. So I, I, I was a 14-year-old kid at adult classes. And, uh, yeah, from there on, everything went super fast. I mean, I think within months, I was beating up the brown belts there, the adults. And they, you know, they, so you hear them talk about you in the dressing room. They go, oh my God, did you see that kid, boss? He dropped Jack today with a, with a back kick to the body. And everybody's laughing. Man, that kid is really good. You know, and so once you start listening to that and you hear them talk, you, 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 well, you become more confident. And uh, around that time, <laughs> I got in the fight with the biggest bully in, the, in my school, Shucky was his name. I was driving, riding my bicycle on the street, and he came with a group of six or seven guys on his bicycle towards me. And, of course, they were shouting something. It was always something like, hey, leper, watch out, your ears don't fall off, or your hand doesn't fall off. You know, something with leprosy, they always talked about that. And this time I shouted something back. And I heard him laugh, and I'm looking backwards, and I see them all make a U-turn, and they, uh, they started to chase me. So I said, no, I'm not going to run anymore. I parked my car, I put it on the stand, on the pavement, and uh, I was just waiting for them. And they surrounded me with their bikes. It's always, I always have to laugh about this, because in these badass movies, you see guys at night, you know, and they, they're surrounded by cars, and the headlights of the cars are the lights, are the lighting for the fight, you know, these illegal fights that they do. And, well, this was the same situation, only this was during the day and it was with bicycles. I got surrounded with bicycles. It was pretty funny. And then Shaki, the big guy, he came and he started pumping his chest into my chest and asking me if I wanted to hit him. So, uh, come on, Ruden. Hey, leper, hit me if you want. I go, okay. <laughs> and uh, that was it. I gave him one punch. One punch, I knocked him out. He was cold or out cold. He broke his nose flat on his face. And that was a problem for me because now he had to go to the hospital. That meant the police was... Uh, cold, of course, and they showed up mom and dad's doorstep, and that was it for me. You know, I, I uh, of course, they took me off taekwondo right away. They, I confirmed right there that it was violence. But I have to say also, they, they never knew. I never told them about my troubles in school that I got bullied so much because you know my mother had so much work with me every night. She had to mummify me. I always call it, you know, but entire of uh, uh, my family members would send old bed sheets and she would rip those up into bandages. And then every night, my whole arms would be, you know, I would get cortisone creams on my arms and it would be bandaged in, so to say. And then in the middle of the night, I would scratch that off from itching and then she had to do it again. So she, worked, she was with me a long time and a lot when I was a kid. So I never really told them that I was bullied in school. I wanted to keep that a secret. Otherwise, I think they would have allowed me to stay taekwondo. But anyway, long story short is that I, at 20, I moved out of the house. And that was, uh, I already actually also started training, but, you know, just watching books and going to, to the library and uh, looking at the pictures and uh, watching Bruce Lee movies and watching, you know, everything I could find in martial arts, I would just practice it by myself. And I've always been very, you know, what I can see, I can do. You know, I, I'm very, I've been gifted with, a, I, I got great athletic abilities, thankfully, for my, for my dad's side, they're all athletes there. And uh, so, but that's how I, started to train. At 20, I moved out of the house and I started doing Taekwondo right away again in a form of karate. They call it Shin Tai Karate. I went really fast. Uh, I mean, got my black belts in both. And I started also, well, I think even when I was already an orange belt or a green belt, I wanted to compete and I wanted to compete Thai boxing. So Thai boxing on the side, still did by everything else. And then I started competing Thai boxing and, you know, and, and that's how that's how it all began. That's that's a long way back. That was, I think, Thai boxing was in '86 or so. Okay. Well, now there, there's something in the way that you're talking about this this violence as a child, the way that that the other kids are treating you, that is a little bit different than the way most of our guests have talked about it. A lot of our guests have had these experiences, you know, I mean, getting, getting into scraps, into fights as a kid, that's certainly not unique. It's something most of us go through at one point or another. But the way you're talking about it, I suspect that even back then, you had a, 
is comfort the right word? For what? For, for, for being around what other people would look at as, as violence. Yeah, for me it was it was a way out, a way out of my out of my crisis. You know, I mean, getting bullied and, and you know, and I, don't, I didn't get beat up a lot because I, I, they couldn't. I was always physically strong. I was very skinny, but I was you know it was very hard to beat me anyway. But the words, you know, it was always the worst. As a kid, you know, when they say the most horrible things, they stay with you. I, I listen. I went after all these bullies. I have only two of them. I made a list together with two other of my friends because they had bullied as well. One was, a, he was overweight and the other guy had a big head. <laughs> and, but, you know, we all became good because the guy who was overweight started boxing, started losing weight. The guy with the big head got a growth spurt. He became like 6'4". So now proportion-wise, everything was okay. But, you know, there was such, such horrible things have been said to us. We didn't forget, you know, and we would realize that if we went after these bullies, you know, and we would never do it with the three of us. We would see a guy that bullied me or two guys. I would walk over. I say, come on, let's go now. They, of course, they didn't want to do it anymore. I said, no, that, that ship has sailed. We got to do this now. You, what you said to me was insane, you know, and I would repeat to them what they said to me. And, and none of them remembered or they were acting, but I truly believe it is because they're kids. They didn't even remember that they said it, you know, and, and those words, they were such a hard words for me and for, for us. That I said, no, I'm sorry, you know. You did it at the time. You're going to have to pay for this <laughs> right now. So we got after them. We solved all the problems. Thankfully, a lot of these bullies were uh, yeah, not good not good guys as well. So it's not like, you know, I, we had guys that said, oh, please, I don't want to do it. Of course, then we're not going to do it. We, I, I kind of enjoy that more if they give up than uh, that still trying to fight. But yeah, it, it brought me a comfort because now I finally was able to stop them talking about me and behind my back and you walking, you pass them and a group of boys and girls start laughing and they're looking and laughing and they're looking back. You know, all that stuff as a kid, it's, uh, it's very hard. So we, we've gotten up to your, what was it, early 20s, maybe even mid 20s, and you're, you're training and you said you were taking Muay Thai. Yeah. How, how did things progress from there? Well, it went really fast. You know, I, I, once I started competing, I realized that I had a neck for it. So I, uh, I knocked everybody out. Um, it's all first round knockouts. I believe I had 12 first, 11 first round, one in the second. And then I stopped Thai boxing because it's very hard for me to fight opponents at the time. It wasn't like nowadays you can simply Google or YouTube somebody and then boom, you got them. So now when I would train, let's say eight or 10 weeks and I would go to the fight, the people there would realize it was me and then they simply wouldn't fight. So I would train for nothing. And that happened two or three times in a row. I go, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore because I'm wasting my energy. I might as well do something else, make some money. So I made a really not so smart decision to, <laughs> to become a bouncer uh, as to, to make money. So I did that. But, you know, of course, the bouncer lifestyle is not the healthiest lifestyle because right. our bars in Holland, they stop at 5 a.m. You know, that's where we close uh, the nightclubs. So you're going to be awake all night long. And, of course, there's going to be after parties where all the bouncers and the other people who work there go to. So, you know, it's not the healthiest lifestyle. And then I made a mistake one time, like uh, three years after non -tra not training, uh, this guy comes to me and I had too much to drink. So I didn't remember this conversation. <laughs> and he asked me if I was interested if, to face uh, Frank Lottman. There was a really great Thai boxer undefeated, something like 49 and 0 with 43 knockouts. And he was training in jail, actually, because he was in jail for something. I don't know what it was, but he was training in jail. They made this whole thing about him because he wanted to come back out of jail and then he would restart his Thai boxing career. And that's how he would start making money. So, you know, me having knocking everybody out, thought I could fight that guy who was way better than me was, you know, because I, at the time I fought on, not, not even an A-class fight. So, you know, that was right away against the real professional. And uh, they called me in February, uh, what was it, in uh, February. And they asked me where to send the posters to. And I asked them, what, what, what posters are you talking about? He says, from the fight. I said, what, who's fighting? He says, you're fighting. I said, who am I fighting? And they go, Frank Lopman. I said, the animal? That was his nickname. And they go, yeah. I said, when did I say that? He said, New Year's Eve. And I'm starting to think, and I realized, oh, man, yeah, I did talk to that producer. I, oh, man, I said yes. <laughs> so now, with my ego, of course, I thought, well, when is the fight? They said three weeks. And I didn't train for three years. So wow. still, having knocked out everybody, I thought, well, oh, this is going to be easy for me. So uh, I said, okay, I will fight. And, of course, that was not a very smart decision. Um, I, I, I simply couldn't uh, fight anymore. After the first round, that was it bus was over. So now then I got so much backlash about that uh, from all the people. They said, hey, see, I always told you that he couldn't fight. 
You know, they forgot all the knockouts that I had. Uh, suddenly, I was the worst fighter there was. So now I wanted to fight again. So then I fought again. That broke out in a big riot because the guy bit a hole in my ear. And uh, so I, I gave him a knee in the pills <laughs> and he went down. And then the whole audience started to fight until, of course, the referee, when he saw my ear, it was clean through my ear. He grabbed the microphone and he shouted, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not his fault, actually. I'm looking at his ear. He bit a hole through his ear. So then everybody thankfully calmed down. And I fought another fight, which I lost. I couldn't come out of the second round because, that, yeah, it was the whole nightmare. There's always excuses. But I had a big infection. There was a whole thing going on. Anyway, the audience, you know, when you win, you're great. When you lose, you're not as great. Uh, well, actually, but nobody likes you. So that's when I said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to tie box anymore. I'm not going to do this in front of these people who are not, you know, they're not behind me anyway. As soon as I lose a fight, suddenly I'm the worst fighter there is. So. I started doing these martial arts shows with my uh, uh, karate sh uh, teacher. And we would do shows like we go to a nightclub and in the middle of the night at midnight, the, the, the lights would go down and then suddenly a laser started blinking and the music stopped pumping. Doom, 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 and then we came up in, uh, 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 you know, nothing, only shorts, like these cool clothing, you know, that could, you could show off a little bit. And we did these choreographed fights on music. And with, with long sticks, with short sticks, with nunchucks, with brake tests, with, we would break 10 concrete blocks. We would, you know, we do these crazy athletic things. I would kick him in the belly. He would throw me away like Bruce Lee did and enter the dragon, you know, and I would make a somersault backwards. So it was a lot of acrobatics were involved. And, and that suddenly caught on, you know. Suddenly, you know, uh, people start asking us if we could do it on these big Thai boxing shows in the break. And then suddenly TV discovered us. And we start doing Dutch TV. And then suddenly we were on European TV. We started traveling throughout Europe doing these shows, like in France and in Germany. And then on one of these shows, we would come out, for instance, if there was a ring, I would not walk to the ring. I would come up with backflips. And then just before I was at the ring, I would make a somersault and then I would jump into the ring. And um, one of the, the a, a guy was sitting there, John Blooming, or not John Blooming. John Blooming is the guy I just talked about. He passed away yesterday, unfortunately. But this was Chris Dolman. They, they're two very close friends, these guys. That's why I'm mixing them up. Uh, that's how I met each other, them, uh, both as well. And um, Chris Dolman was a guy who had an, um, who fought for rings, the organization Rings in uh, Japan. It was a free fighting organization. That's what they called it at the time. Not mixed martial arts, but free fight. And he stopped me and he says, boss, I remember you from Thai boxing. You were such an animal. And now I see you making these backflips and do all these acrobatic things. I think that free fight would be really good for you. And I go, what is it? And he said, well, you know, you can pretty much do anything. You can punch, you can, you can take people down, you can choke them, you can leg lock them, arm bar them. Listen, I didn't even know chokes, I would know, but arm bars, leg locks, I had no clue what that was. But I said, cool, you know, I do it. I would love to try that. So I went to do a workout with him. I got completely destroyed by everybody, much lighter guys than me. I thought I could hold chokes, not blood chokes, because of course you pass out, but on your throat, or your, the windpipe. So I was just forcing and not tapping, but that resulted in me not being able to eat uh, food for three days. I had to drink liquid food because my throat was so messed up. I was so tired that I had to park my car next to the road because it was in Amsterdam. And my, I, I, I'm coming from the completely other side. It's like an hour and a half, two hour drive minimum to go to Amsterdam from where I live in Holland. And I called my uh, girlfriend. And I said, listen, I'm in the car right now. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to park you next to the road somewhere. I'm completely crushed. You know, I can't move anymore. And uh, I came home the next day. She was laughing. She says, oh, so that's it? Uh, the, your, your free fighting experience? I said, no, that's not it. I said, within six months, I'm going to tap everybody in that place. You watch. And, you know, I started training here and there and there and there. And eventually it came true as well. But, you know, I had an injury and an injury there and an injury here. I, I was there once every three weeks. It didn't really work. It was like I constantly had injuries. And then one day he called me. And this is so weird because I would never pick up my phone and my and my voice machine was broke at the time but for somehow I picked up the phone and he says boss it's Chris you got to come to the gym right now so what's going on he says well there's scouts from Japan from a new organization called Pankers it's a free fight organization a shoot fighting organization from Japan and they're scouting for new fighters and he said that you know if you come and you try out they might take you and it's, it's a real nice you know you, you're gonna have a nice job they pay very well so I went to Amsterdam I got in an in a scuffle, so to say, with uh, because they wanted us to punch and kick on video just to show technique. But the guy I was dealing with, he was like a champion from rings at the time. 
and he wanted to show off. So he, he went really hard against me. So I stopped him. I said, dude, we don't have to go hard. They're just looking at technique. So don't worry about it. Just keep it down. And then he turned it up. So I think that he thought I was afraid. So I stopped it again. And I said, it's okay. <laughs> but you have to understand, I will do the same thing back. This is not one way traffic. You understand that, right? And now, of course, it was on. Because now he wanted to knock me out, which thankfully didn't happen. But I knocked him out right away with a high kick, which looks very spectacular, I guess. And I needed to go to the hospital for a bunch of stitches. I cut him above the eyebrow. And I remember the, the Japanese people, they were pointing at me. And they said, we want him. And that was it. Then I think two and a half months later, I was fighting in Japan. That was in September 21st, 93, making my first, my, my mixed martial arts debut, so to say. Nice. Nice. Now you were there, I mean, early. I mean, you know, when, when we, you know, this is a traditional martial arts show. Okay. And we might get some, some newer folks coming in because of you and because of what you've done in the competitive space. But primarily, we're talking to people who are exclusively in the traditional martial arts world. And one of the things I was excited about in having you on was that we get to talk about your traditional roots. And, and I know we're going to circle back to them. But we can't deny the impact that mixed martial arts has had on the world, on the way that the world views martial arts, views traditional martial arts. And so I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time talking about what it was like for you as someone who had grown up as a traditional martial artist, stepping into what we are now in hindsight calling MMA. What was that like for you? You know, it already started with Thai boxing, right? Because I came from karate and taekwondo, and there's certain things you can't do. Can't hit the head, can't, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that you can't do. So when I went to Thai boxing, that was a whole new world open for me because I was the toughest guy in my gym all the time, always. But when I went to Thai boxing, well, they dropped me the very first class with a body shot. But it was because, you know, I never sparred Thai boxing, like full contact fighting. Um, and, you know, when your hands are low, not up, and suddenly they hit you in the face, what you do, you, you, you bring your, you overcommit. You go too fast up with your defense, of course, exposing the body. And I was sparring with an A-class Thai boxer. Yeah, he figured me out in a second. He gave me two shots to the head and he gave me a body shot, left hook to the body, and I went down. <laughs> and that's where my love, you know, like if, if you read on the, online, I have a lot of wins by, by body shots because that's where my love for the body shot came from. So that was the first thing for me when it was from karate and taekwondo going to full contact Thai boxing, that was already a complete different world that opened. So I was used to that full contact competing. At least I was used to that when I started doing mixed martial arts. You know, now, but if you do mixed martial arts and you're a striker uh, going into mixed martial arts, you really think a lot of these people out there now still think that striking is the tough man's sport. You're, if you're a good striker, well, you can win every fight. And, you know, Hoyce Gracie and like Ronda Rousey and all these people, they showed us that's not true. Because, you know, if I don't know the, on the ground how to defend myself from a choke or a, a triangle choke, a leg lock, an armbar, or what, whatever they throw at me, well, they're going to catch me, which I experienced the first, uh, first MMA class that I had. So that was the biggest thing for me. But since I was used at full contact fighting, you know, I was not afraid to go over that hurdle. You know, many, many traditional martial arts, it's great. It's great as self-defense. But you know what? If you fight a good boxer on the street, you're going to have a problem. And I'm talking just about a boxer. And I'm talking about pure doing uh, like karate or taekwondo. I'm not talking about guys who go full contact, kick machine for Kai or Sendo Kai Kan, they're going to do that. That's already different because they're used to full contact. But if you're not used to that, and suddenly they come with you with every power that you have, it's a whole different, it's a whole different uh, view of, of martial arts that you had. So I, I, I overcame that because I was a full contact Thai boxer. But then, of course, I have problems with the ground. So... I knocked my first guy out in 43 seconds. Then I knocked out my second guy with a knee to the, to the body, yeah, body shot, liver, to the knee to the liver. And then from that moment on, everybody knew that I was a striker. So my third fight, I lost immediately because they took me to the ground, of course. And since I was not very well versed on the ground, you know, they caught me. I, he got me in a, in, an, uh, in a toe hold. Now, and if I say a toe hold to somebody who doesn't know what it is, it's not what you think if I say toe hold because people are going to laugh. They say, well, what is that? What does a toe hold do? I said, well, I saw a guy break a shin bone with a toe hold, snap the shin bone in half. So it's a pretty gnarly move that you put on your ankle of a person, and normally the ankle will blow out. But if your ankle is stronger, 
uh, then your shin bone and your shin bone is weaker, well, then your shin bone is going to give up. And that's what happened to that guy. He broke his, his shin bone. So, you know, then I won a couple more fights. Then I lost again by way of submission. And then I got very angry. Uh, I lost one more fight, uh, not by submission. Yeah, well, my last fight lost by submission, but I, I lost two in total by submission, I believe. And then that's the moment that I said, you know, if I want to continue in this and I want to become a known person, I'm going to have to learn the ground game. This is important because now I have three losses and it's go due to not knowing the ground game. So that's when I became completely different. I started asking everybody in Holland, hey, who wants to train with me? Because not a lot of people want to train with me because, well, we go hard, you know? And I found this one guy who was 19 or 20 years old, Leon, Leon van Dijk. And he um, he's an extremely great uh, striker already and he's a really great athlete. And he picked up things really fast. And we just both started like going crazy on the ground we would fight we would uh we would uh, tapes video cassettes instructionals and you know we would realize that wait a minute if you put me in this log i can actually escape look this is how we can escape oh wow i can make this better and then we start working with it and we start some submissions we made it better at least making it better for us so it would fit our body type easier and it was it you know i i uh i've never lost a fight anymore i uh i started doing that two three times a day only that, only three, uh, three times a week I would do conditioning on the tie pads. That was the only thing I would do. I wouldn't even spar anymore in striking. I would only ground fight two or three times a day. Uh, my whole house was full with little, full with little post-its and combinations on there. I would wake up my wife in the middle of the night. If I would dream a submission, I would put her in that submission. Would, <clears throat> would ask her where it hurts. You know, it's your shoulder, right? Yeah, okay, see, it's a shoulder lock. Okay, I would write it down. Next day I would try it in gym. And boy, like anything else, I always tell people, once you work hard, it will pay off. And uh, like I said, I, I haven't had a single loss in my last 22 fights, you know. So I wrapped my career up with a really nice winning streak. But it was all due to learning the game that I was lacking and, and, and just going insane. Once I realized that ground fighting was way more powerful than a striker, then you go like, whoa. I mean, think about this. With ground fighting, I can break every single bone in your body and I can dislocate pretty much any joint. Everything I want to do. If I want to break your leg, I'll break your leg. If I want to twist your knees out, twist your knees out. Oh, your ankle, here's an ankle lock. Here's your, I mean, it's a big power to have as a martial artist. But, you know, in the beginning, we never saw that. We thought, ah, there's two guys on the ground rolling around. You know, it's, we kind of were, we thought it was funny, you know. And now you realize, wait a minute, it's, it's extremely powerful. So this sports like judo and jiu-jitsu, suddenly, of course, they rise to the top, they rose to the top because everybody wanted to learn that game now. Hmm. When you think about your your upbringing, you know, the Taekwondo, the Kyokushin, the Thai boxing, do you think that those, well, let's take Thai boxing out because plenty of people who are competing on a high level in MMA now have Thai boxing as, as roots. When we talk about the, the karate and the Taekwondo, how do you think those gave you an advantage? Or do you think they gave you an advantage? No, no. If, I, if I would have gone in there with just that, those skills, no, they uh, would have given me a disadvantage because you, if you don't spar full contact, you don't know how to fight full contact. And it's, it's just, that it, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the commentator for Karate Combat. It's a full contact karate league that just started and uh, they already had like five shows now. And, and you can tell the first few shows, these guys, they, their, their distance was wrong because they were not used to hitting each other with full contact. So you saw them grow and suddenly, you know, the next time when they came back and I was interviewing these fighters again, they, I said, what did you do different? He says, well, I went to Thai boxing clubs and I started Thai boxing there. And they all did that. And then you suddenly saw that, you know, of course, because they were very skilled karate cuss, it was much easier for them to pick up that Thai boxing. But they did need it to pick it up because before they would lose. If you would fight against a Thai boxer and you're a Taekwondo ka, yeah, you might get lucky with a kick in the face when you're really fast with kicks and with karateka, also maybe something. But, you know, the safe bet, of course, is going to the Thai boxer who's not doing anything else than fighting full contact. And that's the other ones don't do that. So that's why it gives you an advantage uh, if you already know how to fight full contact. So thankfully, I was already Thai boxing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when you hear fighters, because I'll, uh, people come right away, they come to me, they say, yeah, but uh, what's his name? Uh, Machida. You know, the, the, the guy from Brazil, the Machida brothers, the Lyoto Machida and Shinzo Machida, they, they're both karate cuts and they're doing really well in mixed martial arts. How do you explain that? 
I said, how do you explain that? I mean, they're also boxing. They're also kickboxing. They're also doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And he's wrestling. So he's, yes, he comes out and he says, my style is karate. But he doesn't man, mean, mention all the other five sports that he's doing. And that's why he's excelling. If he would just use just karate, well, if it goes to the ground, you're, it's it. The fight's going to be over. Yes, yeah. so you can be lucky. It's like me fighting Mike Tyson, boxing Mike Tyson. If I mix martial arts, it makes martial arts fight against him. You think I'm going to box with him? I, I know I'm a, I'm a great striker, but dude, <laughs> I'm nothing <laughs> like Mike Tyson, right? He will annihilate me. So I'm not going to strike with the guy. I might strike with legs. I might use my legs, front kicks, and suddenly throw out a high kick. Maybe try a right straight because that upper body movement is the same movement that you have with a high kick, and maybe you can trick him. But no, I would try to take the fight as, close, as fast to the ground as that possible, you know, because I, I would never want to get hit by Mike Tyson. You see, so yeah, I, I think if you go to do mixed martial arts, you need at least full contact experience. Now, as you went through your competitive career, you know, from, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, your traditional training, while maybe not the focal point, was still something that was important to you? Yeah, very important. Okay. I always thought, that's what we're doing now with this whole new system. I will talk about it in a bit, but yeah, because I like the respect. I like to be on time. I like the rules that the traditional martial arts have. That, that's why I always tell people, I said, what, what do you suggest our kids do? I said, MMA? I said, no, don't put them in MMA. Do, you know, take a traditional martial arts, but, you know, find a good place. You know, don't find a place where they're handing out uh, belts. You know, every two weeks they have an, uh, a belt test and everybody's passing. You know, that's actually how I uh, got my kids off of karate because we signed them up for a gym. I didn't see them practice one time. They were super bad with what they were doing and they still passed the yellow belt. And I told the guy, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to come back. He says, why not? I say, it was horrible. They don't deserve the yellow belt. Why, why are you giving the yellow belt? But the problem is with a lot of these schools, they, they understand that if they don't give them a belt, and it, the parents always blame it on the school. They're never going to blame it on the kids because if they blame it on the kids, well, that's genetic, they say that, right? They're gonna, because if the kid is bad, well, the dad's bad. And I'm not saying the kid is bad. I'm saying teach him real martial arts. Teach him the real katas in a good way because once you do that, and he doesn't make the yellow belt, at least you don't let him pass. Now he has to work harder in order to come back. This actually will help him in his future and everything in life. You know, but unfortunately, there's a bunch of gyms out there that just handing them out as candy. It's a money-making thing. And so, you know, if you go for a traditional martial arts, make sure that you sign up and that you're ready to not pass a test. You know, how many times did you have a, a, a teacher come to, a, a parent come to you and they say, hey, did you see my, my little son there? He's, uh, and he's like 12, or 12 years old, and he's the third degree black belt. I say, hey, Johnny, come over here. Come here. Show uh, Mr. Boss your high kick. And then the kick, kick, the kid kicks. It's a horrible kick. And of course, I'm not going to say anything, but I go like this. Third degree black belt? He would lose against the white or an orange belt in, in Holland because there it's like, oh, you don't know it? You're not going to pass. It's very simple. You can, cannot pass it six or eight times. So, but fortunately for us also, we have a whole bunch of good gy uh, gyms here as well. So that's the only thing I'm saying. Just Google about it and say, hey, bah, the testing is a little hard. I would go to that place if it says that. Mm. Nice. You know, one of the things that comes up in conversation a lot whenever we talk about traditional versus mixed martial arts, and I don't even like using that, that term in the middle, versus traditional compared to mixed martial arts. You know, everybody's got their opinions, everyone has thoughts, but you, more so than most people, are in a position to really understand and, and talk about both. Yeah, because I've been doing it both. Right. right. Yeah. And that's, that's the only reason, you know, I, I'm just, it's like, you know, it's like Aikido, it's a beautiful sport. It's a beautiful martial art. It's a very difficult martial art. Is it going to work in MMA? It's not going to work. We don't punch like that. We don't give you your arm. I don't fall. And, and swing my arm at you so you can grab it. I'll jab and punch you in the face. You can't grab my punch. It's impossible. You see? <clears throat> now, are there aspects of, um, of that sport, of Aikido, that, that really work in mixed martial arts? Oh, yes. There's a lot of these things that work. We had Jason DeLucia, a guy that I fought three times. He was a, also he did Aikido. And he would use certain things, which we didn't know in mixed martial arts, you see? And then he could be successful with that because they're great techniques. So I'm not saying that nothing works. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you never spark full contact, you, you have no clue what's happening. That's the only thing I'm saying. I, I, I talk about experience. My experience is my first type, uh, Thai boxing fight. 
I was the toughest guy in town uh, in, in my gym. And then in my first Thai boxing fight, I don't virtually don't remember anything. I remember throwing a spinning back kick to the body at him, which, which landed and he, and he dropped. And that's how I won the fight. Everything else that I did before, it was chaos in my mind. You know, it's like, it's like teaching you how to shoot really well, right? You go to the shooting range, you've been shooting for six months, you do it two times a week. I mean, that's a lot of times you've been shooting. And now suddenly a guy on the street, you have a gun and the guy starts firing at you. You really think that's going to be easy now to pull that gun and aim at the guy? You're going to be in complete stress. There's a moment that now you can die as well. You know, so if you've never been in that position, you never know how you're going to react. It's flight or fight, right? It's one of the two things. A lot of people freeze. Yeah, but they, they train two years karate. Yeah, but if they never did that. I have fighters in my gym. No, I used to have because I, right now I'm, I'm more focused on more people on, on training the general audience. And I just teach twice a week. And that's why I don't have a lot of professionals because otherwise I don't, simply don't have the time for them. But we used to have guys that would work circles around the world champions in the gym. The, the world champions mixed martial artists would have trouble with these guys. So we would think, oh my God, they're going to be the next new champions. But somehow, once, they put, once you put a person like that under pressure in front of his friends and family members and an, and an audience and cameras in your face, suddenly they lock up, they freeze. You never know how you're going to respect. And some of them can never get rid of that. You know, some of them takes a while, you know, but they get over it. Some of them, they, they have it right away. They, it clicks right away. Although I have to say that's very rare. I might have maybe three guys like that that I know, not even my students, that went really fast. But otherwise, you know, no, if you're not used to it, even if you spar full contact and you go to a fight, it's a complete different experience. You know, a friend of mine exper- uh, explained it like this, and it's a really good explanation. Imagine you have a plank, and the plank is about a foot wide and, and 20 foot long. And you put that plank on the ground, and you ask a person, hey, can you walk over this plank? You put it on the grass. Uh, yeah, okay, can you do a little turn in the middle? Yeah, oh, that's easy. I could probably do a somersault on it. I mean, it's, you know, okay, good. No, you only have to walk straight to the other side. That's the only thing you have to do. Good. Oh, that was easy, right? Yeah, let's put it in between two buildings now, 15 stories up. Now do it again. And now it's suddenly, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? I go, well, do it again. But now you start overthinking things. Now it's like, wait, if something happens, I'm dead. You know, and that's in fighting as well. You're not going to be dead, of course. But in fighting is when you punch you, when you, you, the moment you're open is the moment you attack. You know, I was always a counter fighter. Uh, I was just waiting for my opponent to attack. I triggered them in attacking me. And then as soon as they, for instance, give me a right straight to the face, I would kick underneath there with a liver kick. You know, things like that I would really enjoy to do. But if you never did that, you know, before, then you never know how you're going to do it once you're under pressure. So everybody who wants to, you know, wants to do a street martial arts, whatever it is, I would always say start competing. Even if it's amateur level Thai boxing, it doesn't matter. Or amateur, whatever, boxing also. But it's still full contact and it will help you a lot, especially if you later want to fight or for in self-defense as well. It's tough. Now you've talked about the, the vast number of martial arts and the schools that you've trained in over the years. When you think back to all those different people that you trained with and trained under, when you think of all those different styles, who are you now most like? Who, who did you draw the most influence from out of all of those instructors? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a self-taught guy. You know, I'm a... Uh... Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have a guy, Roland Janssen. He was the Taekwondo teacher, but he was a guy who would get con- constantly, he would um, you know, d- disqualify that because he would knock people out because he was way too powerful and, and he, he wanted to fight full contact, which was not allowed, of course, at the time of Taekwondo. But since he was full contact, he taught me really great kicking technique and explosive kicking technique and how to do it. So he was a big influence. But for the rest, I've been looking I've been training myself. At my submission game, I taught myself. The whole Thai boxing, my stance, everything comes from two best strikers on the planet. I would say Mike Tyson and Ramon Deckers. Ramon Deckers was the, uh, unfortunately, passed away a couple of years ago. He became a good friend of mine, but he was the guy I looked up to the most. He was a guy who would go to Thailand and just destroy the Thais in their own backyard as a Thai boxer. And his stance was also a little wider. I'm an open stance. I don't blade like a lot of people do because you shut down the half of your body. If you stand wide, like a Mike Tyson would stand, I have almost equal power in my left and right hand, but also in my left and right legs, because now I can use hip and upper body movement. I'm not standing in one line anymore. So I blended Mike Tyson and Ramon Deckers, those two styles together, and that became my fighting style. And uh, it's been 
very successful, I have to say. You know, and it's a nice little pat on my shoulder. But I have to, and, and I never knew this, but when I got inducted into, you, to, into the U of C Hall of Fame, and I was in 2015, they gave me a list of stats about me. And the cool thing that, was, that I heard was that till this day, I have the highest striking accuracy in mixed martial arts. From all the fights that have been there, I still hold the highest percentage. But it's because of that style. I never threw jabs. I never threw the, I just wait for an opponent to make a mistake. And that's where I capitalize and I go in. And that's why I let so many punches. So I always tell people, I say, hey, listen, <laughs> if you fight like that, you can do the same thing. You probably surpass my percentage that I have, 70.6% was, I think. But, you know, somehow other people uh, don't, don't fight like that. I don't know why, because it's a very effective fighting style. Well, maybe I'm connecting dots that I don't have a right to connect, but from what I know of traditional karate, from what I know of Kyokushin, it's very heavy on a counter reverse punch. Yep. And maybe there is something from that, maybe something, if not in technique, in principle, that you took oh. forward. Oh, for sure. Uh, my straight punches. Yeah, listen, I've been teaching a private class this morning and I talk again. Now, all the, what, what, uh, Muhammad Ali started this. He said, as a boxer, you have to twist your hand at the end of the punch, right? And it's funny because I think Muhammad Ali just did that, said that, to get inside the head of other people and let them do it because what you're doing is you're telegraphing if you do that. And because when you watch Muhammad Ali punch, he doesn't turn it over. He keeps his hand straight. And I started realizing, wait a minute, if I bring my, if you turn your hand, right, that means you're bringing your right elbow up. If you punch with the right and you start twisting your hand, your right elbow is coming up. Once the right elbow is up, it's very easy to deflect that punch. I literally have to tap it only on the outside and it's already ricocheting because the elbow is up. It ricochets next to my face. I, it's hard to explain like this. Um, it's better to say on video, but what, what, what karate does, they keep their elbow low as long as you can and you strike through the defense and through the body. And I, I did that in my striking style as well. I don't twist my hand. If it comes naturally at the end, yes. But you know, if, if, somebody, if you tell somebody, twist your hand, you will immediately start seeing his elbow leaving his body, it, it goes up. So as soon as I look, I just have to look at your chest. If I see your elbow move, I know that's a punch coming. I mean, so you're telegraphing me that you're hitting me. If you keep that elbow low and you just go straight forward and you don't twist your hand, that's a karate punch. And that's how I punch in mixed martial arts and in Thai boxing as well, because I believe it's a much more effective punch. Nice. I'm sure the traditional folks out there are listening, nodding their head. Yeah. 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 I, oh, I, no. I, I, was, I was, as you were talking, I was doing it myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, but it's still, but you know, with knees, with kicks, everything, everything is great. I'm just saying to people, for instance, Taekwondo, right? Taekwondo, it's all about speed. It's like double kicks, triple kicks, and, and you simply cannot do a double or triple kick with three times throwing your hips in. It's not going to work. Well, it works, but it will slow down so much that it's going to be easier for the opponent to detect. So if they kick with like a, a front kick and then a high kick, most of the time, those, Kicks are done with power, leg power. I like to, from the front kick, not use, only using leg power, and as soon as I make the roundhouse kick, I like to throw my whole upper body to the side so that I drag my entire um, weight in that kick as well. So it makes it more powerful. So that's why I always say with traditional martial artists, I said, you know, once a week minimum, I would get <clears throat> kick it back and kick it as hard as you want, uh, can. Not don't hold back. Just kick it as hard as you can because it's a different feeling than tapping it and re being ready for a same leg attack somewhere else. You see what I mean? I do. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that's a hallmark of this show are the stories that our guests tell. You know, even our slogan, you know, what's your story? So if I was to ask you for your favorite story from your time as a martial artist, what would that be? You know, there's, uh, I have some, um, yeah, I have some cool stories. I, you know, First of all, when I saw Benny the Jet a long time ago, I was a big, huge fan of Benny the Jet. It was this documentary called the, the Kings of the Square Ring. And he's very prominent in that, in that documentary. And, and man, it's an, what an amazing athlete. I just saw him in, in Vegas again, like yesterday, two days ago. This guy is so fast, so powerful. I think he's 60 fights, two, uh, two decision losses. And I think the rest is all wins with like 53 knockouts. Just the guys and the insane guy. And um, I was watching the documentary King, uh, Kings of the Square Ring. And in the documentary, there's a fight between Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki. And that's coined the very first mixed fight because Muhammad Ali came as a boxer 
and Antonio Inoki was a wrestler and he was allowed to kick and punch and do all that stuff. Now, when Ali came to uh, Japan, they suddenly started changing the rules. Suddenly, he was not allowed to kick above the waist anymore. He was not allowed to punch anymore. He couldn't hold him in grappling moves. So they took everything away from Antonio Inoki and that became this fight. Now, it was a draw at the end of the fight. It was not the most exciting fight, but I was watching that fight and it was, it was at the Nippon Budokan. That's a very famous place where big fights are in Japan. And I was 16, I think, when I watched that documentary. And I, if somebody at that time would have said to me, hey, boss, that place where they're fighting right now, you're going to defend your world title in that place and you're going to beat them. I would have never believed that because I was that sick kid, you know, who had the asthma and who had the skin disease. So to see that, that is, that is cool. That, that was a cool story. Not a cool story that I have. This with Lucia Riker. I don't know if you know Lucia Riker. I don't. Lucia Riker is uh, probably the best uh, female boxer ever lived. She was the best female Thai boxer ever lived in the whole. The only fight she lost was against the, uh, uh, against the Thai world champion guy because she couldn't find any more opponents in the women division. She was just destroying everybody. Anyway, she was 17 years old when she beat Benny Urquid as his sister. And I was there at the fight in Thai boxing. It was a devastating knockout. I've never seen any power. She was just like 16 or 17 years old. She was young, but so powerful. And um, we were like two weeks later or three weeks later, we're, in, we're in, um, in Spain with my friends. And my buddy says, hey, who is that there? Because there was a whole big group of people on the street, but one stood out. And I'm looking and I go, oh no, man, that is, that is Lucia Riker. So we call Lucia Riker and we're like, oh man, this is so awesome. She's so unbelievable. And we start talking that we were Thai boxers as well. And we did karate, we did taekwondo and we love this and competing. And I remember telling her, I said, and, and she heard that story a thousand times because I hear their stories now too, a thousand times. People come to you and they say, hey, remember my name. I'm going to be the next world champion. And that's what I said also, the cocky little guy there saying, hey, remember my name. Uh, I also want to become a world champion. And then I started competing mixed martial arts. And many years later, uh, I was the world champion uh, in Japan already. And I was at a big event in Holland. And suddenly I got a tap on my shoulder and I turned around to Lucia Riker. And she looks at me, she started laughing. She says, I remember exactly what you told me, boss. <laughs> and now you're standing and now you have your world titles. You see stuff like that, that still makes me at this moment get goosebumps because that's cool stuff. You project something, you say it, that it will happen. And then if you work hard enough for it, you're eventually going to get it. Couldn't agree more. So what is it you're out to get now? You mentioned karate combat. You mentioned a number of things that you're, you're working on. And, and honestly, if anyone goes to your website, they might be a little overwhelmed with all the things that you've got going on. I don't know how yeah, you're it, keeping it all straight, but you're clearly really active. So tell us what you've got going on. Going on and more importantly, tell us why. Okay, now, first of all, thing is, I'm, and, then, and, and it's not a plug, although it's going to sound like a plug. So when I was that uh, asthma, severe asthma kid, as a kid, I would also do track and field. Because for my dad's side, like I already mentioned, they're all athletes, and they, everybody did track and field. So I started doing track and field, and I was really good at it. You know, I was always, you know, my high jump, long jump. I, I actually wanted to become the next Bruce Jenner, because decathlon. He was the 1976 gold medalist in decathlon. Yeah. And I really wanted to become that as well because I had a very good shot put, javelin throw, my high jump was high, long jump. I mean, I did everything right except, of course, for the running and especially for uh, the 1,500 meters. That was a hard one for me because that's, you know, with an as, as an asthma patient, that was trouble. But I realized every time if I had an, when I had an asthma attack and I was a weak in bed, not able to breathe, I would resume my track and field and then I would break my running times every time. And I go, man, what is going on? <laughs> So I went to the doctor about every two weeks. I had to go to the doctor to take breathing classes. And one time I was at the doctor and it was the first time I paid attention on the poster that was on his wall. And it was a framed poster and it was a drawing of a pair of lungs and the lung pipes, the airways that go to the lungs and they explained how asthma works. Now, as a kid, you think that asthma is in the lungs, in the actual lungs, but it's not. It's in the air pipes that go to the lungs. They're infected, so they're glugged up, so to say. So it's much harder for your lungs to pull air in through that infected area. So while I'm looking at the poster, a light bulb goes off in my head. I go, oh man, I've been working out my lungs in the last seven, eight days. I've been pulling air in through an infected area, making my inspiratory, my breathing in part system much stronger. So now when suddenly the infection is gone, it's much easier for me to breathe and I can get more air than I normally would get. I, un unknowingly, I have been training my lungs. That's what I thought. So I started training with these little coins with holes in them, putting them in front of my teeth. 
know, try to breathe through there with resistance, you know, to see if I could uh, mimic an asthma attack, so to say, and, and train my lungs with it. Now, anyway, it didn't work. It was very dangerous as well because, you know, you can, if you open your mouth, it shoots in your lung, you're dead. You shouldn't do these things. But it was always in my head. And then many years later, I was still thinking about it. Why don't I make an, an invention in where I can control the air intake? And I made it seven years ago. Now, you have to understand that my entire life, up till that moment, I've been carrying an inhaler with me. So wherever I go, because if I'm sitting somewhere and I sneeze really violently two or three times, my lungs will close. I have to open them up. And a lot of, a lot of other asthma patients will tell you the same thing. Or if I take a sprint, like a 50-meter sprint, and I stop, I'll be good for about a minute and a half, and then my lungs close. It's called exercise-induced asthma. But a lot of asthma patients have the same what I have. I started training with the prototype, and in three weeks, I've never used my inhaler again. Then I sent it to a friend of mine who has asthma in Holland, and within two weeks, he calls me, I want to sell them in Europe because my asthma is gone. Until now, we have 100% success rates from all the fighters who buy it. I made an invention that came out of my disease, <laughs> and I finally made it, and now it's training people, getting rid of asthma, and you can only do, imagine what it does for healthy people. You see, so always something that happens in the past, it, it might help you in the future. This one was one of those big things with me. I had severe asthma, but that made me realize how I could, uh, how I was able to make a long training device in where I can pretty much mimic asthma almost and then make your whole inspiratory s uh, system stronger. And now it's just, I mean, people like Usain Bolt doing it <laughs> and three other gold medalists. I already hooked up with their scientists who trains them with it. So uh, now it's becoming real fun for me because now I made an invention that I came up with when I was 14 years old. That's really cool. Nice. Nice. Now you mentioned karate combat and that's something that's come up on the show a couple times. So how did you get involved with them? Well, they called me. They, they knew, of course, of my uh, Kikushin background and my karate background, and they uh, asked if I wanted to be an ambassador for their sport. And I said, I love it. I mean, I, I, I was waiting for somebody doing full contact uh, karate league. And what they did was very smart, because in 2020, the Olympics in Tokyo, you will have uh, karate is back in, in the Olympics, uh, since it's from Japan. And it's not going to be full contact, but it has the exact same rules as we have in karate combat. So a lot of these people now in karate combat, they want to come on a show and fight because they want to prepare themselves for the, the Tokyo Games in 2020. So yeah, they called me, want to be an ambassador. I said, sure, would love to. And we would like to have you as a commentator. Why not? And then I just started doing it. And now I'm meeting all these great karate cars from around the world, which is so cool because, you know, I never, you know, it's always been mixed martial arts and Thai boxing. Yeah, here and there, I interview like a Dolph Lundgren or something who's also a Kishin guy and, you know, because I had a show on TV for like nine years, a weekly live show. So I interviewed a lot of these people. But, you know, they have to be famous then, like Adolf Lund, who also does movies. And then we invite him on the show, we interview him. But, you know, it's great now to, you know, to interact again with those karate cars and to see these guys being very angry at each other at the weigh-in. But then as soon, if they get in their face, they stop and then they step two steps back and they both they bow out of respect against to each other. You see, that I like. I got goosebumps again because you wouldn't see that in, in boxing or in Thai boxing or in kickboxing. You know, you won't see that. Also not in MMA. That respect is almost not there. And those guys have it. They're in each other's face. They really don't like each other. But just before they break, they bow out of respect both to, to, to each other again. And that's what I love about uh, the traditional martial arts. Mm. Nice. You ever thought about getting back in the ring? Oh, no, I can't anymore. You know, if I, and I'm, I'm happy. I, I think God made that, uh, closed that door for me. Well, it was me, my stupid thing in a fight scene. Uh, never something happened with me in training, but in a fight scene for a TV show, uh, I dropped upside down on the top of my head and I crunched the nerves in my neck and it completely lost my, the, the use of my right arm almost. And it's been seven years ago and it starts coming back now. But like, for instance, snapping my fingers, I couldn't do that for four years straight. I couldn't hold a glass. I couldn't hold a phone. You know, I had four neck surgeries. So, yeah, I have a whole, a whole bunch of plates at the front of my throat, at the back of my neck. I got it everywhere. So, yeah, no, those days are unfortunately over for me. But on the other side, I'm very happy that it happened. Then people go like, well, you're very happy? Yeah, because I know myself. I'm this guy who thinks that I constantly can beat everybody. You know, that, that's, it, it's a kind of ego thing that you develop as a fighter. And you have to, because there cannot be a flaw in your mind. You can never walk to the ring thinking, oh, oh man, I'm going to lose this one. That's, that's unacceptable. You always have to go in 100% confident that you're going to beat everybody, you know, because it will help you in your performance as well. So I think I would have been the guy, if I wouldn't have injuries, who would have kept on fighting. 
um, because I would think that I could still beat them, which is too stupid, of course, stupid, because once you start competing with the guys half your age, who's been doing it longer than you maybe already because they started when they were eight or 10, <laughs> you know, yeah, you got to lose boss. You're not going to win that fight. So thankfully when the injuries came, I had to retire, but that gave me a really great winning streak at the end of my career. Mm, absolutely. Now, if you could go back and talk to your 20 year old self, what advice would you give? Oh, don't party as hard as you always did. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't care about those tattoos that you put on. Don't put it. You don't need it. And, and, and with me, they're very confident. Like if you see, look at me, you, you can tell I have them. I have one on my shin, but that's it. If I wear long sleeves, even if I have no shirt on, you, you almost can't tell because they're always hidden. They're like on the palms of my hand. They're like, uh, you know, the, in the inside of my wrist. You see, so there are not spots that they're very prominent that everybody can see them. But I would say stay away from that. Uh, do better in school, you know, sp- instead of flying through the trees every day, you know, maybe uh, start doing it, learn how to play another instrument that, other than drums, you know, maybe the piano. My dad was really good. My dad, my brother, really good. My brother graduated cum laude, three majors at the conservatorium, also guitar. So it's always good to just to do more work because as a kid, you don't want to do it. But now you realize, man, it would have been great. Like for instance, uh, history. I really enjoy history now. I never enjoyed it when I was a kid. But now I go, man. So when I, when I became a citizen, uh, when my family became citizens of here in America, we had to learn the history. And it was, it was awesome to learn the history about America, you know. But as a kid, you don't want it. You want to play. You want to do other things. But, yeah, fo- be a little bit more in school. Don't use the tattoos, you know. Don't try to be a tough guy. If you're a good fighter, you are the tough guy. So that means you don't have to scream. You don't have to act, you know. How cool would it be if you're totally this guy with no tattoos, very profound, who doesn't use profanity, who does, who's the perfect guy, and then you become a world champion in mixed martial arts. I think that's way cooler than the guy who's fully tattooed, who's shouting the F-bomb, dropping F-bombs in every sentence, you know, than, than, than the guy who didn't, doesn't do that. So, you know, yeah, profanity, I, I already didn't do that for five years. I stepped away from that also, saw it as a weakness, you know, uh, because if you talk to people, all the tough guys, the more they say it, the more insecure they are, man. It's all the time. You can literally tell it, especially when we had fighters come on the show, you know, and I would see when they would get nervous, they would start dropping F-bombs in every sentence. I go, don't, don't do that, man. It looks so stupid if you do that. You know, so, yeah, that I would say. Clean up your act a little bit. Be a less crazy partying after the fight, you know, because we would go crazy for three days. You know, do one day. What about one day go back into training, you know? <laughs> Things like that. That's what I would tell myself. This is great stuff. And I appreciate everything that you've shared today. I appreciate your time. And I'd love to ask you for one more thing. What parting advice would you give to everyone listening today? Oof. What parting advice? Um, yeah, well, I always say there's, there's two I want to give. One I would say, read the book, The Alchemist. From Paulo Coelho, read that book. It's a book that will help in every profession, in everything. It's a book about a sheep's herder who goes on to a journey. And you think, what is boss letting me read now? And once you're reading it, you realize what this book is doing to you. It's transforming your mind to start paying attention to certain things that are important. Omens, they call it. It change your life. This is the book that's the second most translated book next to the Bible. So it's the first in the world. It sold over 75 million copies. There's a reason for that. Every big actor, I heard Will Smith even saying it. And Will Smith's a big uh, I'm a big fan of his. And when I heard him saying, I look at my wife, I say, see what I say in every interview. Read The Alchemist. He's saying it too. You know, so for me, that was really cool. And then I had a, a, a quote on Forbes. Um, and Forbes quoted, the quote that I have, I say, the best life hack of all is just to put in the work and never give up. And it's really like that. Every single, the reason I said that thing is because every single famous person they interview, and it doesn't matter if it's an actor, a musician, a guy, a regular guy, a, what is it, a lawyer, a fighter, they all say, just stay on it. If this is, your, if this is what you want, do not steer away from it. Stay on that path, and then you will eventually get it. That's how it works in the universe. If you show that you want it, you will get it. But a lot of people, they hook off at the critical moment. I remember I did a movie with uh, Kevin James and... Uh, Henry Winkler and Salma Hayek. And I was one of the f- four leads in a movie together with them. And uh, Henry Winkler told me the story. He's the Fonz, for the people who don't know at home. The Fonz, the coolest guy. 
ever. The movie, if you want to watch it, Here Comes the Boom, you'll be very happily surprised. It's a, very, it's a comedy with Kevin James and all these other people. And it's a very fun movie. But what he told me, he said that he moved to uh, New York uh, for his acting, but he hated New York. He wanted to go back to California. He did all these auditions, nothing worked. And then he was driving back literally, uh, or he's driving to the airport, and he gets a phone call from his agent. And the agent says, you've got to do one more audition. And he says, I can't. I'm driving to the airport. He says, this is an important one. You've got to do this admission. Postpone your flight. He postpones his flight, and then he nailed Happy Days. That's how he became famous mm. from that one thing. Now, he was almost steered away from it. And I think the universe was calling him in the form of his agent saying, hey, 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 come here. The universe was also letting me pick up my phone that I never picked up and the voice machine was broke. You know, those things, you have to start paying attention. In that book, when you read the book, The Alchemist, The Omens, that you meet people for certain reasons, uh, you know, nothing is coincidence. Pretty much everything is for a reason. Start paying attention to those things. You know, you trip a certain way, make sure that never happens again because the next time it might be much bigger and then you might really hurt yourself, maybe even die. You know, like, just pay attention to certain signs. And that's what that book teaches you. And it's an incredible book. I think I read it already five or six times now. And every single person I know does the same thing. When we talk about mastery and passion, you know, it's pretty easy to find examples around the world from multiple disciplines of people who are passionate and masterful in their craft. But when we talk about mastery of the application of martial arts, that gets a little more subjective. Now here we have a man who defined what masterful meant to him, and he went headlong into it and showed that yes, he was, is a master of his craft. And I think that that's why so many people resonate so strongly with Shihan Rudin, whether they're MMA fans or traditional martial artists. This is someone who transcends, and that's why I was so honored to have the opportunity to speak with him. Shihan, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your time and your stories with us today. If you want to check out photos and links, transcript, other episodes, all kinds of other good stuff from this, from our other 361 episodes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to check out our products, those are at whistlekick.com. And don't forget, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on our apparel, our uniforms, our gear, all kinds of great stuff. And though the code isn't going to help you over there, you can find a lot of our stuff at Amazon. Hey, free shipping, Prime, might even get to you faster. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And if you want to email me, my address, pretty simple, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Now that's all I have for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.